joining me today to break down some of the latest news and happenings in our great sport of trail and ultra running is my friend, the great Corinne Malcolm. Corinne, how are you? It's nice to see you. <laughs> I love that I'm the great Corinne Malcolm. I'll take that. Uh, I, I have this like weird verbal tick where I have to give everybody sort of like a, a title of some kind. So you are Corinne the Great and uh, I'm super excited to do this with you. Uh, are you broadcasting from from San Francisco? I know you've had a, a fun and busy weekend. I am. I'm back in San Francisco. We got some rain today, which we desperately need. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm in our little apartment, which is in our friend's backyard. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, uh, we'll go into what you were doing this weekend, but I figured uh, on the front end here, we should just do a quick little intro of you just for people who may not be as familiar with you. And um, yeah, so I don't know, maybe just introduce yourself, um, you know, to the listeners and and, uh, maybe go into both what you do as an athlete professionally and, uh, and then we'll get into your eventful weekend. Sweet. Yeah. So my name is Corinne Malcolm and I currently reside in San Francisco, California. Um, I moved here right after Dylan left us. So that was fun. Um, Good timing on my part. I run for Adidas Terex professionally, but I also work as a running coach and a science writer. And I'm a substitute science teacher. I'm teaching freshman biology right now. Wow. um, Which is fun. At at the (laughs) university level or the high school level? The high school level. I am teaching high school biology this spring. Um, Yeah, I like to run really, really far, but I'm actually injured right now. So I have not run much at all in the last six weeks. Yeah. Well, tell us about that. I know you posted on Instagram that you had some sort of a a stress fracture. Maybe tell us from your science-based perspective and also as uh, an athlete who is multi-talented. I know you uh, have also been a winter sport athlete and and generally just a really top-tier athlete uh, your entire life. So tell us kind of what you're doing for your injury, both from your experience and also from your background as a scientist. Yeah. So I had this weird injury that kind of snuck up on me. I've always thought of myself as very durable. So all of a sudden being kind of struck with a bone injury. So I have a stress Mm -hmm. fracture, um, was really bizarre to kind of be taken out like that. And it wasn't, I'm not, it's a weird injury too. I'm not in pain. So what I have is a non-displaced, uh, stress fracture that is healing hopefully in my pelvis. Mm -hmm. Um, I was in pain for like all of 24 hours back in January and it, it got better, but running felt off. Like there was mm-hmm. something wrong that I just noticed in my running that wasn't getting better even with rest. And so I got an MRI when I got back to the Bay Area in early March and it lit up big time. Mm-hmm. Like I had bilateral stress reactions and a left-sided stress fracture um, in my kind of your front pelvic bones. Mm. And so the best thing for that is some rest and then some gradual loading. So I've taken five weeks off and then started some gradual running again last week, all 15 minutes at a time, (laughs) one minutes, 15 minutes at a time. And then, um, got a repeat MRI last week. And I'm hoping that I meet with the, the wonderful Dr. Emily Krauss this week to discuss it. And then hopefully kind of get to move forward from there and get to get back to, running and racing, um, as we all come out of COVID hibernation. Shout out to Emily Krauss, one of, uh, the great minds in, uh, yeah, recovering from injuries at, at Stanford, a dear friend of ours, also from the Bay area. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that you're injured, but it's great to see that you seem to have a good attitude about it and that you're doing all the right things. Was it difficult for you to spectate a race all weekend? So it's so funny because honestly, so I think we are similar in this way. Like we're good at turning it off. Like we have enough other stuff going on in our lives that like, if we can't run, we like figure it out. It's, it's okay. It doesn't necessarily eat away at us. Um, so five weeks of no running kind of flew by. I like rode the bike. It was great. But then I showed up at canyons and had those Western States feels being back in Auburn. Um, Got to see a bunch of friends and teammates from all over the country racing. And I love spectating and I love crewing and volunteering. And I was there volunteering this weekend. 
And so that was very, it like fed the soul, but I also was like, wow, okay. I now, now I miss running. Yeah, totally. So last question on this injury thing, cause I am just gen, generally curious <laughs> and I just sort of put two and two together myself. Uh, last year, you set the FKT on the Tahoe Rim Trail, which is like 150 mile circumnavigation of Lake Tahoe, an incredible accomplishment. And someday we've got to have you on and just go deep on that effort and your actual like running prowess rather than talk about the news of the day. But obviously that's like a huge undertaking for your body. And you said you've always thought of yourself as a durable athlete. And so this has been a little bit of a shock. Do you see any correlation between that huge effort on the TRT and potentially this bone injury? There's always a chance that it's connected. Yeah. So TRT was in October and it was 171 miles around the big blue lake. And 70. Wow. Yeah. So it was amazing. But I, I thought I was being very smart coming back from it. I have a wonderful coach who I have a lot of faith and trust in. And we took it really easy. Like I rested, I went on a climbing trip. Like I didn't run at all. Um, and we were starting to kind of add back in intensity when this happened. So I hadn't really done any intensity until um, December, January time. So mm -hmm. it's possible that there was some weakness lingering there and then that the intensity finally made it go. Yeah, But it was far enough after the actual event that it's kind of hard to tie the two of them together. Yeah. Well, Corinne, I'm sorry to hear that you're hurt. Um, and uh, I'm sure, yeah, it was somewhat melancholy or bittersweet to go watch some people race super hard over the weekend. But it is always therapeutic and healing to be in the company of ultra runners and witness people pushing hard. So why don't we transition and talk a little bit about what we've been referring to at the Canyons 100K over the weekend. You were there. You are our on-course correspondent, which is why I'm so excited to talk to you about it. You had a front <laughs> row seat to the action and racing is back and I'm so pumped. But um, I think uh, we should go sort of deep on both the men's and women's races. But I think before we do that, maybe just share your top line reaction about uh, how the race went, uh, any things that um, you saw over the course of those hundred kilometers um, that you thought were notable general themes. And also, I guess you said that you were volunteering. So why don't you tell us um, sort of what you were doing as a volunteer? Yeah. So the wonderful Canyons uh, endurance runs happened this past weekend in Auburn, California slash Forest Hill, California. Um, I've, have you raced canyons before? I haven't, but I've done Western States several yes, times. So. Yeah. Well, canyons <laughs> is mean because the traditional canyons course is an out and back two out and backs from forest Hill. So yeah. you run Western States in the, like the most terrible direction. Yeah. This was a modified course this year due to COVID. So there were no out and backs. It was a point to point, which I'm not sure if it was harder or easier about the same amount of climbing, but I was actually there volunteering as a COVID safety liaison. So um, I got to check all the runners in, in the morning, keep everything organized, do temperature checks, kind of just like go through the COVID safety protocols. A lot of our participants were vaccinated, which was really awesome to hear. Um, and then as the race got going, I bopped out to the middle of the course and got to help that aid station out at Forest Hill, making sure that people got out of the aid station smoothly, um, and just witness everyone run. It was really fun just to see everyone and then volunteered at the finish again. and you know, it's this weird balance of keeping a normal race atmosphere and wanting people around the finish, but the permits that race directors, you know, have to fight to get oftentimes do hinge on public policy. Mm -hmm. And so that hinged on us, you know, properly masking up, making sure that we didn't have con big congregations of people. So my job at the finish line was actually just keeping spectators spread out and just out of the general finishing like shoot area kind of being like, yes, your runner will come to you in a second, like yeah. one second type of thing. Yeah. So it was kind of a weird, you know, it's weird to finish a race like that, but everyone was a really good sport about it. And I think it was still a really good finishing atmosphere, but yeah, my, my role was just keeping everyone permit happy. Yeah. So when the Rangers came by to check on us, you know, everything looked good. Everyone was doing what they were supposed to be doing. 
Well, thank goodness for people like you and thanks for, uh, for volunteering and making it so that people like me could sit on uh, my computer and on my smartphone and enjoy it as a spectator digitally. Explain the course a little bit, because as you mentioned, typically the race starts and finishes in Forest Hill and you do sort of a double out and back where you run backwards on the Western States course, come back to Forest Hill and then run down to the river turn around at the river and run back to Forest Hill as well. This year, it was something different. So can you describe that? Yeah. So and actually, we haven't run the original course of canyons um, since 2018. The 2019 course was also modified due to snow. So that was kind of a, a faster course here, a little bit less climbing. But this year's course, to eliminate out and backs for running runner congestion, they started in Auburn at the Overlook Park. Um, so that you kind of, you drop down to the river there. You kind of, you go over across No Hands Bridge. You climb up from No Hands Bridge. Um, but you you never have to cross the river on foot, for example. Like you don't have to go across the main river crossing. Um, they all had to experience the terrible backwards climb on the Western States course up to Forest Hill. Beth Pascal after the race yeah, was like, I don't like that direction. Um <laughs> And then they came through Forest Hill, which was great to have that kind of those Western States feels. And then they headed out um, in the traditional direction that the race normally starts in out, you know, down Bath Road, um, you know, having to do the El Dorado to Deadwood climb, which is hard in that direction. Then they did a, a loop out at, off a of Deadwood Road um, and had kind of a grindy climb. I think there were 3000 feet of climbing in like the last 11 miles. So instead of going to Michigan bluff, you continue up Deadwood road. Is yeah, that right? That's, up that's Deadwood where road. Max King went off course. It sounds like, yes, he okay, had, we can, we can go into that later. Finish up your description. <laughs> he had some issues out. At, I think actually past Michigan bluff. Okay. Um, they had some issues out that way. Um, and then they finished at China wall staging area, which is just a big trailhead out there. So they kind of had a long grindy climb into that. Mm -hmm. Um, so about the same elevation, I th think as normal, as far as climbing goes, kind of that but, 14 to 15 K, but a net uphill overall, but net uphill instead of a big, you know, instead of downhill, uphill, downhill, uphill, yeah. it was generally speaking after the first 25 K very much net uphill. Cool. Well, thanks for providing that visual uh, for those of us who've had the privilege to run the Western States course. Thinking about running it backwards is a pretty difficult uh, thing to imagine. And uh, I haven't looked at anybody's Strava files yet, but maybe I'll do that to help understand exactly what that course looked like. Um, so let's go into the race, shall we? I uh, yes. am so kind of uh, interested to hear your take on what went down. Both the men's and women's races were very interesting for different reasons, I would say. And I think maybe we start with the women's race. Um, yeah. What were, uh, what were some of your top line uh, reactions to what happened in the women's race and, and maybe provide a little synopsis for those people who didn't follow it online? Totally. And I just, I was thinking about this in talking with one of my friends who was out there racing and said, you know, when you look at the race results for any race, like, yeah, there's times and there's places, but that like never tells the full story of what actually happens out there. Yeah. Um, and I think that that, you know, was kind of portrayed out here to like out here yesterday, I guess, on the course, um, Beth Pascal just put on a master class in racing. Yeah. Um, they, uh, her along with Audrey Tanguy went out fast from the beginning but interestingly, and this was, you know, a major factor in the women's race, both of those women have tickets or not, they have spots in Western States already. Beth Pascal was fourth in the 2019 edition of the race and Audrey Tangai has an ultra trail world tour spot. So they were not racing for golden tickets. They were just, they're here, they're here until the race. They're just getting on the course. They're they haven't raced in a long time either. So they were just both like pulling the bandaid off. Yeah. So, so we should mention that they're both European. Beth Pascal is from the UK, Audrey Tange from France. They both have traveled over. And as you said, didn't need the golden ticket. So they were here just, just to race and I guess uh, acclimate before the big dance coming up in nine weeks. So pick up from there. Yeah. And then you had the golden ticket chase following them. And that was made up, um, of Abby Hall, 
Emily Hoggood, um, Taylor Nolan, and then some names that are probably less familiar to people, Becca Wendell, Le- uh, Leah Yinglang, Scarlett Graham, Tessa Chesser. Um, so it was kind of this like interesting battle. And it was an interesting battle too, because it was a bunch of, um, it was three Adidas Terex women, three of my teammates made up part of that battle. Um, one of whom was on her third attempt to get a golden ticket. Emily Hoggood, this is, she's done Bandera and was third. She did Black Canyons and took a tumble and was seventh. So she really wanted a golden ticket. And then <laughs> Abby Hall, um, who, who only decided that she would take a golden ticket on Friday. So, so she was saying, if I were to finish in the top two people who were going to secure their, their golden ticket. So, mm-hmm. uh, basically she did ultimately finish second, but as you said, Beth Pascal and Audrey Tange did not need the golden ticket. So those always bump down, uh, to individuals, uh, who might place a little bit lower, um, to get those golden tickets and the, the true, uh, honor to be able to run Western state. So you're saying that Abby was ambivalent about whether or not she would accept the ticket, uh, until Friday. Until uh, Friday. And then we'd be remiss if we missed, um, uh, EO Wang was in that golden ticket hunt, yeah. um, had to drop at mile 48, I believe. And she had worked her way up to, she started easy, but I think I, she ran a really smart race, but just didn't have the day that she was hoping to have mm-hmm. and dropped at mile 48, but she was in that hunt as well. And it was up as high as fourth, like just 20 or 30 seconds behind Abby Hall. And then, um, Carla, um, another Hoka runner, um, who I believe is also from the UK, um, also didn't have the day that she was hoping for. And I believe that she dropped either at Forest Hill or shortly after Forest Hill. Yeah. Um, so it was an interesting, interesting day with some good names in the women's field while kind of the front two, for the most part, ran away for most of the day. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about that because I think there, uh, thanks for the the synopsis. Um, but I think there's a lot we can go into detail on in the women's race. And as you mentioned, I think that the key takeaway is just that Beth Pascal was in a league of her own yesterday. And it was super impressive to see. Um, I think she's sort of like quietly been one of like the true badass women on the international circuit over the past few years. She's been top five at UTMB twice. As you mentioned, she was fourth at Western States back in 2019. And then in 2020, when nobody was racing, she broke the FKT on the Bob Graham round, which of course is an iconic fastest known time route in the Lake District in the UK, her home country. And so she's put together like some world-class performances over the course of the last few years, but I don't think anything to this level where she turned in just a dominating performance, ultimately winning by more than a half hour. And should have won by more. Really? She actually, there was a little whoopsie. She probably should have been ninth or 10th overall, but she, um, she took a small wrong turn right before the finish, essentially like maybe a quarter mile away and got to the finish, uh, San Francisco runner, Patty O'Leary tried to get her back on course, but missed her. Um, She finished right in front of Patty because of that small course cut. And so myself and the race director and Patty got Beth back out on course after we realized what had happened. And she ran another little loop to finish appropriately just to make sure it was all tidy. So she actually came in under 10 hours. Oh, wow. She came in under 10 hours. My guess is it cost her a couple of minutes. We'd have to go to her watch to see for for sure. But she was there for a minute or two, Mm -hmm. had to run back like across the parking lot to get back out on course and then finish again. So she probably like without that miss, she would have been under the 10 hour mark and would have won by 35 minutes or so probably. Yeah, just truly incredible. I guess her official time was just over 10 hours. It looks like 10.01.55. And that's only, what, 50 minutes behind the men's winner on a course like that is incredibly impressive by Beth Pascal. And now she definitely has to be in the conversation as one of the favorites 
for Western states, which we'll talk about in a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so cool to, to see that sort of dominating performance on the women's side. And then I, you mentioned your friend, Abby Hall, your teammate, Abby Hall, who is, uh, is sort of becoming one of my favorites on the circuit as well. She's been a guest on the show in the past after she did an unsupported uh, FKT attempt that ultimately was was unsuccessful. She made it to the finish, but she didn't break the FKT on the John Muir Trail last summer. Again, in unsupported fashion, and something that I found a lot of inspiration in. But she has really been coming into her own in the last couple of years. And you said that she was a little ambivalent about taking her Western State spot. What did you uh, did you? I'm sure you interacted with her. Um, yeah, during and after the race. So uh, maybe provide some detail into how things went for her because she ran just a really solid race and, and ultimately finished second. Yeah, so she um, ran in th like fourth and third for m much of the day and moved up into third coming into Forest Hill um, and made up time on Audrey, which was really cool that she kind of snuck Audrey at the end for that second place finish and they finished, you know, within a minute of each other. So pretty tight racing for yeah. the women's top, um, top, you know, two, I guess, two, three, four, yeah. um, Abby's focus for this year was going to be CCC and she'll still, that'll still be on her calendar, assuming races go off in Europe at towards the end of the summer. Um, and she was nervous about trying to do that double because that double is hard. Um, but Coop, her coach, Jason Coop, as, as you know, super well, um, yeah. told her that it was possible. Um, to do both. And I, I'm really intrigued by Abby coming into Western States now with this golden ticket, because I do not think, and I think this is a fair assessment. And I think that she would agree with me here that I do not think that she has performed to her potential yet mm -hmm. in a hundred mile race. Um, yeah, she's done, she's run, Leadville. she's done Leadville a couple times yeah. and, um, I think she would qualify at least one of them as a death march. And so I'm really excited. I think Western States is a, Western States is a great race course for her too. And so yeah. I'm just thrilled that, you know, she decided to go for it, that she had a great day yesterday and that she will be towing the line at Western States. Um, but yeah, she, she just ran so smart yesterday, um, looked super solid and steady all day. And honestly, I thought she looked stronger at the finish than she did when I saw her at the halfway point. So mm -hmm. I think she found some good legs out there too. Groovy. Was she uh, excited about the opportunity to race Western States or is she looking ahead with a, a little bit of intimidation uh, given that she wasn't exactly excited about it until the day before? Um, well, so she was, she was housing with Stephen Kirsch um, in Michigan Bluff this week. And Stephen Kirsch has a lot of love for that race. And they're in he Michigan out there Bluff. for a training camp, Stephen? He, he was out uh, helping us out, helping oh. Adidas Terex out with some, with some film work. And um, he himself will be racing Western States this year. And so I think he just planted that seed and she couldn't say no. Um, but I do think, I don't think it's dawned on her yet. I'm really excited to, I will not uh, be crewing or pacing. I'll be busy during Western States this year, not running, but up to other shenanigans. And, um, I'm going to have some good sit downs with her and Emily and hopefully Ruth just to talk logistics at Western States, because it, it it's, we, I feel like you and I both know the race really well, um, having experienced it ourselves. And that's just some interesting Intel that I'm really excited to get to share with my really good friends, but also my teammates. Yeah, it's great. So as I said, Abby is really coming to her own recently. And just to put some things in context for the listeners, she was eighth at CCC and then fourth at the TNF 50 in 2019. She's won the Moab Red Hot 55K, which is one of the most you know competitive early season races in the Mountain West every year in Moab, Utah. As I said, she did the unsupported JMT in just super badass style and was second at the Crown King, Crown King Scramble in Aravipa race in Arizona well, just a few weeks ago before taking second again at Canyons and earning her ticket into Western States. So kudos to Abby Hall on a super strong, well-executed performance. And then, as you mentioned, Audrey Tangay from France finished third. She's a two-time winner of the TDS and has podium finishes at some of the best races in the world, like Diagonal Defu, Madeira Island Ultra, Lavaredo, and then your, your other friend and teammate, 
Emily Hoggood finished fourth. And you said that those three were really, uh, they finished very close together. Uh, it looks like a total of about two and a half minutes separating the three of them in second through fourth position. Anything you want to add about Audrey or Emily? Um, and I guess just to reiterate, Abby took the first golden ticket. And then since Audrey had already gotten in through the Ultra Trail World Tour, that second golden ticket kicked down to fourth place in Emily Hoggood, who it looks like is from Zimbabwe. I don't know a ton about her. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit? Yeah, so Audrey ran a really impressive race. She went out with Beth or right behind Beth early in the race, um, but Beth just slowly pulled away essentially. But at the halfway mark, Audrey had probably six minutes six minutes on Abby, maybe eight minutes on Emily. Um, so they kind of steadily worked their way up. Um, I have so much respect for Audrey's running, having been behind her at TDS in 2018. Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, it's just exciting to have these international athletes coming over and racing. Um, I think that she was probably not stoked to be caught right near the end there. Um, but was a really good sport about it. And it was made for a really wonderful women's podium. And then Emily is a is finishing up her master's degree um, at uh, Western in Gunnison, Colorado, um, but is from Zimbabwe and is applying to stay in the States longer. We hope that we get to keep her. Um, but she has had, I mean, she's got a great race history, um, but she's had quite the 2021 Um trying to get this golden ticket. As I mentioned earlier, she was third at Bandera in a narrow, narrowly missing that ticket, took a tumble at Black Canyons um, and stuck it out. I think a lot of people in that position who wanted a golden ticket probably would have dropped in order to yeah, be fresh. You know, yeah. be fresh for a third attempt. I know that her coach, um, she's coached by the Lind family. Um was maybe not thrilled that she was going after another hundred K in such uh -huh. a short span of time. Um, but clearly it went okay. And she ran really, really well. And I, she was over like overcome with joy at the finish. It was really, there's this great photo of her and her coach at the finish line. And it's just like, they're so, so excited. Um, yeah, but she sent it yeah. to me. It's one of those sort of like goosebump inducing yeah. things where you can yeah tell the the pride that they both have and yeah maybe the relief of like yes I finally did it I actually do get this opportunity and it'll be interesting to see and I think one of the the themes uh, looking ahead towards western states which we'll get to eventually in our conversation is just those who have run races and those who haven't run races uh, races before Western States and who knows, I mean, it could go either way for her. She could be a little bit banged up from running 300 Ks since the beginning of the year, or she could be, you know, the strongest person in the field having, um, sort of had knocked the rust off more than the rest of us who, who've sort of been on the sideline during this, this pandemic, but. Yeah. And she's been in the States for a while. Um, she, um, did her undergraduate degree here as well and ran in Idaho collegiately. Hmm. Um, so she's been, she's been around, she's been, you know, in the States for a while, um, but kind of came out of college running and into the trail and ultra scene. Um, and is just running really well. It'll be, I'm excited to see her get to tow the start line. I mean, all these women, I'm excited to see tow the start yeah. line. The race is shaping up to be really, really good. We'll get to that in a second. Let's talk about, the, <laughs> let's talk about the men's race now, unless you have anything else you want to add about, about the women. Um, the men's race was won by Anthony Costales from Utah, uh, super strong racer, but I think maybe we, we start again by, uh, just deferring to our on-course correspondent, you, Corinne Malcolm, uh, any uh, top-line reactions to the men's race or details that you witnessed personally that stand out from yesterday? Yeah, so the men's race was really exciting and interesting, just like the women's race. Um, but at the front end, it was a golden ticket hunt from the beginning, which I think definitely flavored it a little bit differently. Um, and it was packed up a little bit more so there wasn't this front runner just you know anthony wasn't just off the front from the get-go um when they came through forest hill 
Um, it was actually Anthony Costales, Max King, and Cole Watson all together. Essentially, um, they left like they stationed right after each other, and they were moving and hunting that golden ticket already. Um, what what and then mile we, is Forest Hill approximately? Forest Hill in this race, it's thirty three point five. About halfway. A About more, halfway. halfway. And then we had a couple men who were in the chase, but not, they did not come into the race looking for a golden ticket. And that's um, uh, Noah Brottengam out of Salt Lake City, Utah, and Preston Cates out of um, Arkansas slash Boulder. Um, and we need, we'll, we'll need, we need to talk about him in a second. Yes, um, I can't wait. I wanted it's, to learn it's about him. Exciting. Um, so the men's race was kind of hot from the get go, but it was bunched up much more. And then I want to say that Max King, um, his little whoopsie by Michigan bluff, um, ending up taking almost a 10 minute detour definitely added some extra excitement over the back half of the race. Yeah. So I guess let's, let's get to that now. So, so Max ultimately finished second. He was about 13 minutes back by the time all was said and done. But as you mentioned, he took a detour that added about 10 minutes. So really, it would have been really close between he and Anthony had he not made that wrong turn. Uh, I know Max was coming into the race desperately hoping to get a golden ticket. Max hasn't run Western States since 2014, where he led the race for, for much of it. I was running that year. and remember it. In fact, I passed Max at like mile 95 <laughs> that year. I'm As sure he was probably walking. I'm sure he's still oh. pissed about it, but Max is just an absolute legend, a personal inspiration of mine. And still running as well as ever, it seems like as a, as a master's runner now too. So, um, yeah, talk a little bit more about, um, yeah, I, I'd love to hear your perspective on Anthony's performance as the winner, uh, sort of how you're thinking about him as an athlete, as we look ahead towards yeah. Western States and, and any other, um, things from the podium runners there. Definitely. So I, I mean, I think we're, we've all been quietly excited, maybe not quietly excited about Anthony Costales. Um, he, I feel like has been knocking at the door for since, since, since 2019, like year before the pandemic, right. One way too cool that year. Um, let it was up, up in the front early in the North face endurance challenge that November, but ultimately finished seventh. And I think that was, you know, it just didn't, he didn't have the day that he was looking for, but he also is the proud owner of a 213 marathon PR. He has some real, real w- wheels and um, just, he, he had a solid day. I think he had the hundred K technically debut that we've been waiting to see from him. Um, so I think he's one of those guys that goes into Western States with a, like a, an excitement asterisk where it's like, who knows what will happen because he has the talent to pull off a really amazing Western States, but we all know how many fast guys and gals have come into Western States and made the same mistakes. Yeah. So if he can have a good crew to hopefully help him avoid those mistakes, we could see some really amazing racing, I think from Anthony. Yeah, totally. And just to kind of re- emphasize something that you said, he's a 213 marathoner and that's probably the fastest marathon PR of anybody in the Western States field this year, Jim Walmsley included. I think he ran 215 in the Olympic trials. Uh, Max King, I think, is somewhere in that neighborhood, 213, 214. But Anthony definitely comes in with a lot of pedigree. And to your point, this being his debut, I think this is another one of those good examples of something that's a huge pet peeve of mine. And that oftentimes debuts when you're talented is like an actually a good thing. And mm-hmm. I think coming in with a little bit of ignorance uh, and with a lot of excitement is an advantage sometimes. And he had that at 100K this weekend. And now he goes forward into Western States, which will, of course, be his 100-mile debut in a similar position. And so it'll be super, super interesting to see how Anthony approaches Western States with the 213 pedigree that he has. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, additionally, I believe, so he's, he's a, he grew up in California, but I also believe, I feel like I overheard this at the finish line. Um, I think he's, he's an elementary school gym teacher. And I think most of his running is him running to and from school. Yes. So I think he run commutes, um, 
which reminds us of some other people, but so I don't think his, I don't think he's been a super high mileage runner because, yeah. you know, he runs to and from work every day, kind of as his, as his general training. Um, but he's so talented and I'm so excited to see, um, what, ha- what, you know, he p- hopefully can put together yeah. come the end of June. Well, I I'm having both he and Beth on the podcast yes. later this week. So we'll get to learn a lot more about him. Uh, I'm, talking to Anthony tomorrow, Monday, and then Beth on Wednesday. So we'll hopefully have those episodes out um, by the end of the week. And uh, yeah, really excited to learn more about both of them. Um, and then I, the other thing I just wanted to point out, and um, you know, there's you know a couple of other, I think, notable things from the men's field, but also I think Anthony and Noah train together occasionally. I know they're both from Salt Lake City, and I just uh, want to give a shout out to the Salt Lake City contingent. They've got a quiet but deadly group of guys training there right now. Both Anthony and Noah Brodingham, who finished third, Jimmy Elam, who's been racing super well over the last few years. And I know there's, there's a few others um, in that Salt Lake City contingent, and they seem to all be pushing themselves. And that's one of the, I guess, key themes I talk about on the podcast is training in the right environment. And it looks like these guys are really pushing each other. Yeah, they had a great, and they had a great showing. They had, um, Brian Curl was, uh, seventh in the race as well. So they had three Salt Lake guys in the top 10. So they nice. won, they won, uh, the, the, the city and <laughs> the state country, award, yeah. the cross country meet. Um, Bend actually had a really good showing too. Um, but that's besides the point actually and Noah, interestingly, um, his wife is Swedish and they just moved out of their home and they are on a road trip and then they are headed to Europe. And they're trying to move over there for a while because his wife has been in the States for a long time. Um, so they're going to, they're actually trying to head to Sweden later this summer. So um, we're Salt Lake city, I think is sad to see him go, but I think, I believe this is also his hundred K debut kind of yeah. Noah's big um, race result over the past couple of years, I think would be winning speed goat um, over some stout runners, um, including I believe Hayden was in that race. Yeah. Yep. Including Anthony Costales and Hayden and Hawks. Hayden, yep. Um, and so, you know, yeah, that, pl- that was the first time I heard Noah's name was at the speed goat hundred or I'm sorry, speed goat 50 K in 2020. One of the few races that happened in the summer of 2020 and yeah. Noah beat both Hayden and Anthony and others in that race. So, yeah, I feel like I had insider knowledge about Noah because I've, I know him through the ski community. Yeah. Um, his wife skied for U of Utah and we've got a lot of friends in common. So I got to, I got to cheer him on out there yesterday. And that was, it was just so cool to see him do well. And I would say like, what's really cool about this men's podium too, is that you've got, it was actually a Solomon sweep, which mm-hmm. I think is notable. Right. Um, you have, you know, Max's 10 years, Anthony and Noah senior. Yep. And it was Anthony and Noah's debut hundred Ks. So it was kind of this interesting mix of like some of the, the new talent that's in the sport. Um, and then Max, who's maybe the most versatile ultra runner or one of the most versatile runner, ultra runners, runner, you know, runner in general, yeah. runner period, steeple he's, he's chaser. Won, he's won Mount marathon. He's run in the steeple chase Olympic trials. He's run in the marathon Olympic trials. He's won races probably of every distance from 400 yeah. to a hundred K at least. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's, you know, kind of the, not to put an asterisk on max. Um, but I think the hundred mile has kind of been this, thing that has eluded him. It's been the one who's gotten away. Yeah. Um, I, I know that Leadville was hard. Um, I know that Western States was hard. And so I'm, I, I know that he can put it a good race together, but I feel like the hundred mile distance has been the one thing that has eluded Max King as far as like successfully really checking that box off. Yeah. And so I so hope he finished the race and he said, I don't want to run Western States and then took the golden ticket. So I think <laughs> that, uh, he was hungry for it, but you know, you, we finish any ultra and we're like, never again. Yeah. Well, he did make it very clear that his goal was to get that golden ticket. And, uh, yeah, I just can't wait to see him take an, another crack at Western States seven years after that first try. So I, I want to hear about, uh, this guy, Preston Cates, uh, cause you, you teased that you had something to say about him, but I also just want to give a quick shout out to David Laney who ran a super smart race, finishing fourth place. I think he was back in eighth place or around halfway at Forest Hill and, and ultimately ran his way through the field to finish close to the podium. So shout out to David Laney. 
yeah, he steadily moved his way up. Um, and it was really, I was, when they announced that he was coming in, I was like a little bit, like I was surprised just given his placement in Forest Hill. Um, so he ran a really strong back half of the race. And then we have the young, as we just mentioned, Preston Cates, um, 23. He graduated from, um, Arkansas in 2019. Um, his, I got to meet his dad. His dad's really, really wonderful. Um, his dad's been around the ultra scene for a while. His dad's been in the ultra scene for 15 years. Um, so Preston is not unfamiliar with trail and ultra running. Um, it sounds like he graduated from school and then actually moved to Austria to start grad school. And then the pandemic hit mm -hmm. and Preston came home. Um, I believe um, spends a lot of time out in the Boulder area. I think that's where he grew up. And um, he ran his first ultra this winter. Um, he ran his first 50K this winter and followed that up closely with his first 100K, um, which I think were January and February. Yep, January was his first 50K. February was his first 100K in a blazing 812. Um, and then showed up here. And I think some of the guys pointed to him at the finish and said that he was responsible for kind of breaking the men's field like open early. Really? Um, yeah, that he just kind of was this like, little secret pusher early, <laughs> yes. but he looked so calm and jolly at the halfway mark, just kind of doing his own thing. He came through the halfway mark in fifth faded a little bit as David Laney moved up through the field. Um, but overwhelmingly every, you know, all the guys that came in around him and all the guys that finished in front of him were just so impressed with the run he put together. Sweet. Um, and he, you know, did said the same thing, like I'm never running again yeah. at the finish, but <laughs> I believe that will be short-lived and I so hope that this is just the beginning for Preston. A lot of people at the aid stations were like getting very much Andrew Miller vibes okay. from him, how yeah. he just like was like this young guy who all of a sudden we were like, oh wow, like just this happy young male runner who's, you know, crushing the field. Yeah. So I so hope that this is just the beginning for Preston and that we get to see more of him because um, he's... 23 fresh out of college running um but yeah. clearly very composed yeah i thought it was funny just having followed the the twitter feeds and uh also it being the first time that i'd heard his name and seeing the pictures of him and it looked like he was wearing a camelback from like he 1995 <laughs> and like some road shoes and uh clearly yeah just kind of new to the game but uh super talented so it'll, it'll be fun to hopefully follow what he does in the future so yeah he came into forest hill and we're like is that a racer yeah. like he looked so unfazed and just like yeah he's wearing a camelback from like maybe the early 2000s yeah and uh yeah just did his thing and it was so so impressive um yeah, cool yeah, he made him. He left a mark this weekend, and I'm excited to see where that goes. Sweet. Well, thanks for giving us so much uh, uh, commentary from actually uh, firsthand experience. Uh, it's really great to be able to sort of live live the race through your eyes a little bit and hear how it all played out. And uh, it's super fun as a fan to actually have races to talk about again and twitter feeds to scroll through and and uh yeah now some things to talk about for the future and i think that's what we should sort of transition to now and look ahead towards the western states 100 which is coming up in nine weeks and the field is now set the canyons 100k was the last of the golden ticket races and uh i think you and i will have a good time just sort of bantering a little bit about how we're feeling about the race coming up, who we think is in a good position and what sort of the themes and storylines are. So I wondered if you'd put any thought into this over the last 24 hours since the race finished, any, uh, any themes you're looking forward to over the next couple of months and uh, for the race itself. I mean, so it's really interesting because we've got a handful of golden ticket races that happened pre pandemic. So there were some names that I was going through that I was like, wait, this is Bandera from 2020, like just like trying right. to figure out who had done what. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we have, I think I looked at it earlier and we have um, eight men and eight women each returning from the top 10. Um, myself, Caitlin Gerben, um, Tom Evans and uh, uh, Gramidius okay. are the four, yeah. The, yeah, the two, the two 
uh, women and two men who are not returning. Um, so we've got, you know, a lot of the top 10 back, including, you know, the likes of Jim Walmsley, um, getting that sponsor spot and the M1 bib. And then we've got a great ultra trail world tour group coming in some day. We'll have some debut hundreds from some interesting folks. And then the golden tickets are really just a smattering of runners from all over the place, some international, some Canadian, some East coast, some West coast. Um, we've got some interesting sponsor spot positions, including Magda, Magda. um, and Ryan Montgomery, which are, I think, interesting ads to the field outside of the golden ticket, ultra trail world tour and top 10 spots. So it's just, you and I both, I think, agree on this point where you have to have a lot of talent on the start list to have a good race because 20% of those people might not make it to the start line. Another, let's say 20 to 30% of those people, you know, they just don't have their day. Something happens early in the race. And so in order to have those tight finishes that we have grown to love at Western States and UTMB and these big, these big field races over the last couple of years, um, really boils down to there being enough of a field to make that happen. Yep. And so given what the field looks like right now, I mean, it's hard to say, you know, is this the most competitive year ever? Cause every year feels like the most competitive right. year ever, yeah. but I do think it's setting up to be a really interesting race with some names that are going to be totally new to folks. Yeah. Um, and some really obviously very established runners as well. Totally. Yeah. And just circling back to something I mentioned earlier, I think one of the most interesting things to sort of keep our eyes on is the difference between those who've been able to run a tune-up race and those who haven't. And uh, just, yeah, see where, I mean, it's just so strange that kind of like the first big race to come back is the Western States 100. And there's going to be a lot of the people in the field who have winning or podium ambitions who haven't stepped to a starting line in more than a year and, or who are, have raced significantly less than they have traditionally in their careers. And so trying to think about whether that's an advantage or a disadvantage, right? So for me personally, I always like to run a tune-up race before sort of like my big A goal for a season. And, but yeah, I don't know, on the other end of the spectrum, you could see a bunch of people come in with just amazing freshness and the uh, yeah ability to go as deep as they possibly can because they haven't been pressing that button and going to the well like they usually have when racing is happening as normal. So I think that's going to be a really interesting uh, theme to watch out for if there's any consistency across you know, the, the people who have raced and have built that strength over the long course versus those who, who might be coming in without a lot of race experience in the last year, but who are much fresher. And then I don't know, like looking at, at the, the women's race in particular, I see it as like super wide open. I think if we're thinking about interesting, if thinking about kind of like what could happen or who the favorites are, I think you'd have to point to like Claire and Brittany Peterson as being the defending first and second place runners. And then, and then Beth, I think um, after her performance this past weekend, but I think the women's field is like super wide open and you could yeah. see any number of these um, super talented women being on the podium, it's much more difficult, I think, to uh, sort of come up with who the favorites are versus the dark horses on the women's side. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, if you look at, I feel like the golden ticket runners in that race, even um, a lot of them have experience at the race. There are a couple that, you know, it'll be their first hundred maybe. There are a couple that'll be their first hundred, but I do, I think it's wide open. I think there's a lot of unknown in that field. Like we've got some ultra trail world tour spots that they've never run a hundred, including the likes of Ruth Croft and Keely Henninger. So I um, wanted to ask about that. I don't know if you have any insight into Ruth because just from following her on Instagram, she, I think was running a, a marathon, marathon this weekend. She was trying to set like a marathon PR and she's been doing a lot of marathon specific road training. And so I wondered if you knew if she was still planning to come over. Um, 
And I mean, because she's obviously a, a really interesting person to look for because this will be her first 100 mile race as well. And she has just been an absolute assassin on the international circuit, super versatile athlete too, being able to race sort of the golden trail series, sky running type races. And, you know, in her career up to hundred K she's won CCC. She totally has the pedigree to win this race, even though it's her hundred mile debut, but she's doing marathon training right now, which is crazy. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting mix. And from what I know, at least from the last I have heard, she is planning to race there to just talk about timing of, of when she comes over um, more than anything. So I believe that the plan is for her to race and she, her ultra trail world tour spot came late because she is taking over um, Miss Kelly Emerson's spot. Okay. Who has a young baby. Um she was supposed to start the race last year, mm -hmm. um, but has like a six month old. And so Ruth took her ultra trail world tour spot. And I don't know if they've reallocated, um, Lucy's ultra trail world tour spot mm. or not. That would be one more ticket that might be hanging out there somewhere. Yeah. Um, but cause they have been trying to reallocate that to the field. So as far as I know, Ruth's coming over and how marathon training will, you know, transition over. She did, she did, you know, as we know, win, run and win the Terrawera hundred K yep. or 101 K earlier. Won it, won it overall. Overall. Yeah. Yes. Um, she's it was primarily, CCC. yeah, she's super, super strong athlete. And it'll be interesting to see kind of like how that marathon training translates to, because basically if she gets through this marathon this past weekend and is healthy, she would I probably just have to do a lot of kind of slower, long, easy runs. running yeah, yeah. And, and be in a really good position to just build volume and sort of de-emphasize the, the speed work and come in just yeah. hopefully fresh and strong. Yeah. Really, so it'll be yeah. really interesting. Um, there's also a number of women who were injured or have injuries kind of going into the pandemic who will be racing. So we haven't seen them race in a long time, um, or they've only raced very little. Um, so I'm just, I'm excited because you're right. I mean, I always think, I mean, maybe outside of gym racing in the men's field, I always think the field is kind of open because then you don't count count anyone out, like including yourself if you're on the starting line. Yeah. But um, who knows what's going to happen in this yeah, in course. this field? We can yeah, only speculate. Course. Yeah, you mentioned Keely too. And I just, I feel, uh, yeah, compelled to say, I actually ran one of her workouts with her this week, <laughs> just a couple of days ago. And she's in, she's in great shape and she's super excited about it. We actually filmed it for our, our YouTube channel, the show sort of cool. Keely getting ready for Western States. So just a, a little tease for that. It'll be fun to see. Yeah, so that'll Oregon. be her first hundred. Yeah, cool. So the men's race, any uh, any sort of reactions looking ahead towards the uh, Western States 100 as you look at the men's field? Well, I mean, we'd be remiss to not mention Jim Walmsley getting that M1 bib coming in as a, a late ad in uh, getting a sponsor spot to that M1 bib. He yeah. was not going to run because he was supposed to do comrades um, yeah. coming off of marathon trials type stuff. And I think that with a lot of races being postponed to the fall, this just kind of opened the door for him to come back and run. So it'd be interesting to see, um, you know, I, I really, I really liked the one, two between him and Jared Hazen. I thought Jared Hazen ran a really good race yeah. in 2019. And so I'm really excited to see what he could possibly do out there. But again, there's so many people who I don't know well enough yet. Like, yeah. you know, golden ticket winners from Bandera, for example, who from their ultra signup is, is legitimately <laughs> like only Bandera from, yeah. you know, so I'm, I'm really excited to see kind of what kind of talent that brings in. So there's a lot of wild cards and that, and then there's, you know, our, I feel like our dear friend, Tim Tolfson. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited to see him run Western States. He's been, you know, focusing on constant redemption at UTMB. And so I am thrilled to see him tow the Western state start line. Yeah. Um, 
this June and just, you know, really hope that he can have a, have a really great day out there. Totally. I was actually texting with him the other day too, and <laughs> not to blow up his spot or anything, but it does sound like he, uh, he's very excited for the race and he's in a good position right now with a couple months to go. And the way I think about the men's race is really, cause I, like I said, I think the women's race is like super wide open where I wouldn't be surprised to see like any number of women actually win or finish on the podium. And in the men's race, I sort of see it as like a story Oops. of two, two tiers, like the, the race horses and the work horses. Right. So we've got the Walmsley's, the Jared Hazen's, the Matt Daniels, Anthony Costales, who we've talked about here, Hayden Hawks, Tim Tollefson, like those guys, I, I think there's probably a 90% chance that one of those guys wins the race, but mm -hmm. the, then there's just this, other class of workhorse type athletes like Tyler Green and Drew Holman and Mark Hammond, who's finished top five, three times. And Alex Nichols, who's one of the best kind yeah. of most consistent athletes, Eric Sensman, Stephen Kirsch. I mean, the, the list is insanely deep as we've said a couple of times. And so what I think it'll happen is yeah, just an immense amount of churn in the top 10 late in the race, because I think that there is going to be sort of a front pack, um, and yeah, the, in, without a lot of, uh, races under their belts and with a lot of potentially testosterone, uh, coursing through their veins, you could see, I think a lot of, um, attrition in the second half of the men's race. And so then athletes in that sort of workhorse division, I think could, um, really benefit, um, sticking to a more intelligent, more uh, sort of measured race plan and run their way into the top five or onto the podium. Yeah. I think it's that, you know, if, if you can recall the 20, the end of the 2019 men's race, um, that like, Oh, was it like seventh or eighth through like 15th? That was just like yeah. packed up in a lot yeah. of way. Like most of them dropped their pacers in the last mile because they were just dropping insane splits to get to the track because it was literally down to the wire. Yes. Um, and some of that's attrition. Some of that's, you know, men going out trying to get really close to the sun and exploding and, you know, having a epic last 20 miles, um, which we don't see as much of in the women's race. They just, they, they run a more measured race, generally speaking. Um, so it's the tale of two strategies too, right? It's the tale of, going out in that lead pack and hanging on, um, or chasing. And then there's this other pack of runners, I think in both the women's race and the men's race who, you know, maybe they, they, that recognize the race really starts at forest Hill. And maybe that means that you're out of contention for that one, two, three spot, given how deep the field can be at this point. Um, but the, the race for four through 10 or four through 12 is like really hot because you've got people moving up in that field who are just going to eat up the people who, couldn't quite hang and went out hard. Totally. Cool. So the last thing I want to talk about just briefly is the jackpot 100, another race that happened this weekend. I think it was the USATF hundred mile championship for whatever that's worth. Uh, it looks like Zach Bitter won, who's uh, sort of made himself the, the king of the, the road and track ultras. Um, but he sort of had a, a, a bittersweet 24 hours. It looked like, cause he won, won the race and then had his hundred mile world record and 12 hour world record broken by a Lithuanian runner in the UK. Uh, and then Stephanie Flippin, a name that's new to me, won, uh, the jackpot 100. Did you see anything about this race that you thought is worth mentioning? Yeah. And you might have to remind me of his name. Um, Zach, Zach did ultimately end up winning, but he, you know, there was some interesting stuff that kind of took place off the front with Raj Paul going out really hard yeah. and, and unfortunately blowing up, but I'm excited to see him continue to show up at races. Yeah. Um, and hopefully some more trail stuff, um, as he kind of comes into ultra running more and more. Um, I think he put on an impressive start to the race and it's just, that's ultra running sometimes attrition happens to you instead of other people. And then I was um, really impressed that Camille Heron didn't necessarily have the day that she was hoping for, but did not drop. Yeah. That she was as far back as fifth at one point and I think was struggling with some heat and some stomach issues and did some puking and, and did not stop. I think that, um, you know, we've seen Elise drop out of lots of races over the years when things yeah. aren't going their way. 
um, because you, you got to get back to another start line and it's hard to push your body like that. But I was really impressed to see her fight through it and to finish second. And I think that that, that deserves a degree of kudos for yeah. sure. I was going to say the same thing, just seeing what she posted on Instagram. I think it is really cool and, and admirable just to see the grit of yeah working your way through a really low point, dropping several s- spots and not giving up on yourself and running back into second place when I mean, you could easily just pack it in. I think the last thing I think this is somewhat interesting as it relates to Camille and Pat Reagan, uh, who finished third among the men, is that they're both on the Western State start list as well. And uh, I think it's no secret that they're both strongest on sort of the flatter, less technical type races, but it'll be interesting to see how they bounce back from a hundred mile effort on roads, which is certainly something that probably uh, takes a lot to recover from or is fairly abusive on the body and uh, see if they can turn it around and get themselves ready for a totally different type of hundred mile race at the Western States 100. Yeah. And I think if anyone could do it, it, I, I think it could be the two of them. I think that Camille Heron has the potential to someday win Western States. Yeah. I, I have no doubt in my mind that if she can put it together and get through that first 50 K and get to the later stages of the race, particularly the last 40 miles, particularly the last 20 miles, I think that, you know, Camille Heron can run a really good Western States. We just, we haven't seen it from her yet. And I so hope that one of these years that happens. And then I think Pat is just incredibly talented. And obviously we know him more as a, you know, taking on the kind of flatter hundreds, but he, I would describe him as a durable athlete Mm. and has a great ability to bounce back from doing, you know, quite a variety of races And, you know, I think if anyone can bounce back from a road hundred in time for Western States at the end of June, it might be Pat. Yeah. And he, of course, finished eighth at Western States on his first try back in 2019 as well. So he's got the top 10 ticket. So anyway, well, Corinne, it's so fun. Racing is back. (laughs) Thank you so much. And uh, just to give the audience a little bit of a tease, you and I are going to be working on something really fun during the Western States 100. I'm not sure we're allowed to talk about it yet, so I won't say anything, but... I'm hoping we find out tomorrow if we're allowed to talk about it, but (laughs) um, hopefully we'll get to share all of that with you soon. And it's shaping up to be a really cool project. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for providing your energy and your enthusiasm and your firsthand experience at the Canyons 100K. Sometime we're going to have to get you on and actually talk about uh, your running, but good luck in the recovery from your injury. And uh, we'll talk to you again very soon. Awesome. Thanks for having me.